Uh, and we talked a lot about in the various couple of weeks all the ways that this is a good thing, but all the ways that this also can be very problematic and we need to actually think through what do these things actually mean to us and why. You know, so for the first week we talked about our, our dreams and our fears and then we talked about academics and last week we talked about organizations and leadership. Uh, and this week perhaps is the most interesting or the most anticipated topic, perhaps one of my favorite, this week is about relationships. Uh, and so why are we talking about relationships? Well, it's because everybody's talking about relationships. Uh, you're talking about your own relationships. The ones you have, the ones you wish you had, the ones you used to have, the ones that they have, the one that he now has and shouldn't have, and all that stuff. And we're always talking about relationships. Um, and, and so I think it's a good topic for us because I think it's very relevant for UVA. I think it's very relevant for uh, you as students. Uh, you are in a giant fishbowl with lots of young, attractive people who you're on all the time. So obviously this is a topic that I think is pretty salient for us. Uh, so that's why we're talking about relationships in this series. I think it's the last place, that kind of the last big piece of place that we try to measure up, we're trying to make sure we're fulfilling our potential, we have a lot of hopes and dreams, I think, relationally. But I am talking about relationships tonight because it's always been important to me. Uh, I've, I've uh, had to kind of become a bit of a relational expert in my job as a campus pastor. I feel like most of the times people come and talk to me, they're like, hey, I've got a situation, and I know what that means, or I can usually guess. Right? And so we talk about it, and there's usually feelings involved, and it's confusing. There's a lot of angst, and like I get it. I get it because relationships matter to us, and relationships have always mattered to me. But I want to say that my expertise, if I have any, it's not just from reading books or studying the Bible or praying, though that has all happened. Uh, to be honest, all that has happened usually because of my own personal experiences. Uh, so for me, relationships have always been very, very, very important personally. I feel like from just a very young age, like as soon as I was kind of like aware of girls or whatever, I was like, oh, like relationships like that is what I want. Like. I had this like idea that it's not a great like you know Greg you you were meant for love I was meant for love right so uh, I decided this was something that I really wanted to go after so I started really young uh, my first girlfriend uh, I was 14 and uh, we at least in my book that's pretty young and we lasted for about a month and a half because we got scared that our parents would find out so we broke it off then it was a little bit awkward because like we see each other still on occasion so that's always fun so see, you start young but I said you know what well that was one mistake you're a little young you're not even out of the house yet like maybe 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 don't be so deterred Greg get back into it because really you care about relationships and you were meant for love so I said, okay, yes, I'm still meant for love. So I got to high school, and when I got to high school, uh, I went to a New England boarding prep school, and so I got this kind of like college, living in the same dorms and like all the same community all the time, experienced much earlier, and so like that was awesome, I guess, if you wanted relationships. And I met uh, my first real girlfriend. I met when I, uh, uh, we got together when I was a sophomore, and uh, I met her. Uh, I knew her for a little while, but you know we were friends, kind of in a group at first. But I got to know her a little better because she was also on the track team. She was very sweet, very cute, very nice, and she was. Smart, she was a good runner, and I was like, yo, that's like things that I am and I want to be. So I was like, we got connected pretty quickly. Uh, I fell for her pretty hard, and we uh, got together, I guess, uh, November or so of my sophomore year. And um, pretty quickly, because we were seeing each other a lot, we are hanging out a lot, we you know, we had the same practice schedule in the winter and spring. Uh, we were very, very emotionally involved, we were very, very physically involved, and to my desires, I was like, this is the best. This is exactly what I want. And so I was like, look, all you need is love, love is all you need, and I had it, so I was like, boom. My life is complete. This is, the, this is the best thing. I was just so happy. Uh, but I, I, guess, I guess it's really not that simple, though. right? And maybe it's because I was 16 and a half or 17 or whatever. But I, I think, in a sense, like, you know, love isn't really all you need. It's not that simple because uh, love didn't seem to deal with our arguments or our values differences or the ways that we just sometimes just wouldn't see eye to eye about things. And so after a good bit of fighting, a good bit of kind of figuring things out, usually a negative term, right? We, uh, we split, so we, I think we were together for about seven months and broke it off. Um, and despite it being you know, pretty early in my life, I was, what, 16 and a half? I was pretty crushed. I mean, I had put all I had in that relationship as much as my barely able to drive self could do, right? Like, I was doing all I could to be a good boyfriend. I put so much myself in that relationship, and so when it ended, man, I was just really, really depressed. Uh, and so that kind of began a whole series of a lot of mess. Uh, for the rest of high school, because, you know, like, what do I do now? Uh, and, you know, so we were together for seven months, and we broke up, and then another eight months, I, like, still wasn't over her, and I wasn't with anybody else, and there were some other girls that I went after, and I was rejected, it just didn't go very well, and so after eight months, I was like, man, this really sucks, like, why am I still not over this girl? So I said, I'm so tired of still wanting to be with her, I'm going to want to be with somebody else. That sounds like a good idea, and so I got together with someone else who was, interestingly, also cute, also sweet, also nice, and also on the track team. And I was like, you know, she's really still in my first girlfriend, but that doesn't really matter because I'm with somebody new now, right? That's going to make it all okay. Uh, until, you know, like two months in, the second girlfriend was like, do you ever compare me to your first girlfriend? 
And I was like, uh, <clears throat> no, not, not at all. But she knew, because I was a bad liar and she could tell, right? Girls can always tell. And so she wouldn't stand for that, as rightly she shouldn't, so she left. And so then I was again there, upset again after we had another breakup, another failed relationship, and, and I still wasn't over the first girl. So it was just terrible. It was just terrible, right? More depression, more being upset, more feeling lonely, more emo music, all that stuff. I was on Zango, man, don't go back and look for that. It was bad. It was a bad time. Right? <laughs> and so, but after kind of like, I got to my senior year, I was like, look, I still don't have a handle on these things. I'm just going to kind of do whatever I want at this point, you know? So because I still wasn't over the first girlfriend, I went and told her that, hey, I actually still really love you. And she said, yeah, I'm actually going to still hung up on you. So like that was like fun and pleasant and like inconsistent and awkward. And kind of simultaneously, I was still seeing seeing uh, my other ex-girlfriend, and like it was kind of this ambiguous place where like we would hang out, but it was like, were we a thing? Were we not a thing? And then we were almost sort of friends with benefits, but then we weren't. And then I went to prom with my first girlfriend. That was great, even though we weren't together anymore. And then I graduated, and I was like, okay, so now what? And I was lonely, and I was all by myself, you know, back at home. And so I said, well, you know, like, my first girlfriend's kind of done with me now, and this has kind of been upsetting, and we went to prom, that wasn't that great, and I shouldn't have done that. And so I called my second girlfriend up, and I was lonely, I said, hey, why don't we hang out? So we hung out, which really was we made out in the back of my car, at a place that I had often spent time with and visited with my first girlfriend. So I got home after that, and I was like, I am a mess. I'm just a mess. A complete and utter mess, and I was in a really bad place. I was feeling really, really, really unhealthy. And I think at that point I was asking myself, am I still made for love? Because this has just been disastrous. Well, I will say when I got to college, one of the major things that happened on the way to college, and especially when I was there, was that I began to take my faith seriously again. And many of you know I grew up in a church, but uh, if you know my stories, I've told some of it, I really was not in a place in high school where faith was, per se, my, my most important thing. I think I did it because I was supposed to, and I fought with God a lot about what that meant and why. Okay? So I wasn't a good Christian, a strong Christian, a consistent Christian in high school. Okay? When I got to college, I feel like a lot of things changed, and I began to see that there was more to faith than I had grown up with seeing. There was actually more about it that was practical and real, and it mattered, and it made a difference in my personal life, and so I started to kind of grow as a person again, a lot of the old wounds started to heal, and uh, at this time, when I was uh, actually a sophomore in, in college, uh, I met a girl who was, uh, I mean, she was really different, and she was, uh, my first girlfriends were wonderful people, they still are, but there was something much, much better and different about me and about this girl in college, and you know, she was a fellow leader in the fellowship, she was also a Christian, right, we had the same kind of values, we both valued faith very similarly, I mean, we were both caring about the same things, and we cared for the people, and it was just fantastic. So when we got together, man, it was just so, 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 so different. Um, for one, we had some physical boundaries, and so we weren't kind of in this physically unhealthy place in terms of our intimacy, so we kind of protected that a little bit. And uh, we were pretty emotionally open, but also spiritually, I'd say, we were definitely encouraging for each other. We would pray for each other. We actually would uh, read books together. We would do all this stuff that, like, you know, good Christian couples are supposed to do. And I was like, man, this is fantastic. And it was a lot better than high school. It was so much better. And we would, you know, so we had been together for quite a long time at this point and kind of passed that first mark. You know, I've been together with my first girlfriend seven months. This one we're going longer. It's like, hey, we passed that kind of like first deadly seven month marker. This is a good sign. Like maybe, maybe, may, maybe she's the one. That's what I really thought. I said, maybe she's the one. And so I started to pray for that, praying toward that end and kind of preparing myself for that. But, you know, we were also, if I'm really honest, into some different place and that began to show itself when I was a junior. Uh, later part of my junior year, we began to fight a lot. Because there were things that God was calling, kind of calling her to focus on and calling me to focus on. And there were ways that we just would never kind of see eye to eye. We'd kind of pull apart from each other. And we would never feel like we understood each other. Even though we were still praying together, still going to church together, still reading together, still encouraging each other, still doing all these good Christian things that were actually really healthy for us. We were still fighting. And eventually we couldn't take it. And so on the night of the night that we wanted to celebrate our nine-month anniversary, she left me. We broke up. That was it. And I don't blame her. Because... As we started to fight more and more, it was just destructive, and it was hurtful, and like our friends got involved. This is very complicated. But suffice to say, at the end of that, I was even more crushed. More crushed than I ever thought I could be before. I remember I would wake up those days after that, and uh, like, color. You know, when you play with Instagram filters or whatever, you can saturate or desaturate color. I, I like, didn't see color. It was that bad. I had trouble getting out of bed, and when I would go around, like, I was so stuck in my memories, or like thinking about how am I going to get her back, or what could happen if things changed. I got so stuck in that, like, I would, like, walk places and not know how I got there. 
Now, thankfully, that never was like a bad thing. I never would like walk into the street and get hit by a bus, like in you know Mean Girls or whatever. Right? But, but I would remember that like, I would be walking into like a dining hall or whatever, and like I started to think about like you know, what would happen if I did this? What if we said that? What if I saw her here? What if we had another conversation about these things? What if we just came back and talked about it again? What if we spent time apart? I would just keep going. I would just go crazy all the time thinking about these things. It was so haunted, and I would like end up however long later sitting at a desk in the library, and I'd be like, how the crap did I get here? I wouldn't even know. That's how bad it was. And I was, it was so dark and so lonely and so hurting. I was just so hurting that I really asked God this time, okay, am I really made for love? Because I put my all into this and I did it right. Am I really made for love? And it was about that time that uh, God began to really, really graciously and patiently speak to me uh, in a new kind of way about, about these specific things. And he said, actually, Greg, yes, actually, you are made for love. Yes, you are made for love, but, but actually, Greg, I need to be honest, you may not really know what love is. Love may not be what you think it is. Yes, Greg, you are absolutely made for love, that desire in your heart from when you were, I don't know, 12, 10, 13, 14, whatever, from the very beginning, that desire in you, all of that, in you, yes, you are made for that. But it also might not be what you think it is. And I want to lead us into a passage today that I think can help us see this. And maybe some of you have even heard of this passage, or you may not even know it's in the Bible, but you read it before. Uh, people like to read this at their weddings. And so I want to give you a minute to read this, and if you look in your chairs, you'll see that I have the announcement sheets, and on the back we did last week, we have a, a Bible passage. So I'm going to give you a couple minutes to read this. And again, this is just one of our ways that we try to get people more kind of engaged with the conversation, uh, you know, other times with the Bible study. But let's, let's read this, and so I'm going to give you a minute to read this on your own, and then we'll come back together, and I'll, and I'll read through it together with us. look up if you're done. But take your time. First Corinthians 13, 1 to 8. If I speak in the tongues of men and angels, but have not love, I'm only a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith that can move mountains but have not love, I am nothing. If I give all, if I give away all I have, if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy, it does not boast, it is not proud. It does not dishonor others, it is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered and it keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing but it rejoices with the truth, and it always protects, it always trusts, it always hopes, it always perseveres, and love never fails. I think it's easy to see why people like this passage. I mean, even if you don't really have much of a religious or Christian background, there's a beauty to the way that love is talked about here. And, and maybe you never read that first part, um, and, and I purposely included it there, because the author of this passage uh, was a very important Christian leader in the first century. And he was writing to a body, a, a community of, of Christians and people figuring out their faith, who they were kind of getting a little confused about what love or how they should conduct themselves. And so he put this little preamble in there. And I've included it for us today, even though people don't include it in their weddings, but it's very important, I think, for us. Maybe you should include it when you read it at the wedding. Because it's important for the setup, because this preface tells us something very important. It reminds us of the reality of what love is not. What love is not. If I have not love, I gain nothing, I am nothing, empty sound. Well, look at some of these things that it talks about, if I have not love. You may have this thing, if you don't have love, it's not worth it, right? There's a, there's a subject A, and there's like the, if I have not love part. Uh, what do these individual things mean? Well, the first thing is tongues, the tongues of men and of angels. Now, in the original context, 
the author was talking about people being able to supernaturally uh, speak other languages and even speak a language that could enable them to communicate with God in a special kind of way. Okay? Uh, and that's not what we're going to talk about today. It doesn't actually apply specifically to romantic relationships, obviously. Uh, but I do think there are some parallels for us. Um, you know, I, I always remember, you know, so I went to some of these, like, summer nerd camps where, like, you would take classes or whatever. Maybe you went to those. You don't have to raise your hands. It's awkward. But I would go to these nerd camps, and it's kind of like college for a summer, but you're all nerdy and awkward. So, like, everyone's on the level playing field. Or, you know, your first week of college when you kind of move into the dorm, there's always, 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 really early on, some guy who, like, Moses on out to like the uh, the center of the quad or sits on the bench and he opens up a guitar and he takes out when, and when guitar guy takes out his guitar and he starts just strumming along for a little bit playing some music what happens within minutes girls just flock to him now I always envy guitar guy because I'm bad at guitar I was never good at guitar but you, you just watch it it's like it's like it's hard to understand he's just sitting there strumming along he's playing Wonderwall or like just the way you are usually really badly and singing really badly, and they're all singing really badly, but they're having a good time. And I always envied Guitar Guy, because like, you know, who wouldn't want to be surrounded by 10 girls or whatever, right? Guitar Guy. And I think there are so many ways that we look at talents, particularly, you know, uh, oh, she can dance, mm, right? Or all these other talents, like, oh, she's an athlete, mm-hmm, oh, you just, you know, all the ways that you, like, they, all these talents, all these traits, all these talents, that we look at people like, oh, that makes them a good person, that makes them a good catch, right? We use that, but it isn't love. A guitar guy, as good as his guitar, he, he may not be a good boyfriend. You don't know. Well, so that's talents. That's the tongues piece. What about the next one? Understanding all mysteries. You have to get to prophecy and wisdom. Look, I know plenty of smart people who are hardworking, get good grades, uh, who are actually really terrible uh, boyfriends or girlfriends. Intelligence is not the same thing as love. Look, I know that we all, probably from an Asian context, your parents are like, you need to find someone who gets good grades, who studies hard, who has a respectable major, who's going to get a respectable job. What do you mean she's studying art history? No, 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 no. Like, right? like, you want to find someone who looks like the right academic profile. But, you know, being honest, if we're being humble, intelligence, good grades, all that stuff, that's also not love. You can be smart and be a terrible, significant other. What about the next one? Faith that can move mountains. Now, specifically as a Christian, right, we're remembering that this is important for, it's just plainly stated. You can have a lot of faith as a Christian. That's not the same thing as having a lot of love, okay? I know lots of Christians who have lots of faith who don't have a lot of love. They'll beat you over the head with the Bible, all things that they know, they think you should know, the things you don't know, right? They act superior to you. They act very faithful. They know a lot of things, but they're not loving, okay? So for Christians, it's pretty straightforward. But for just a general population, what does this mean, faith that can move mountains? Well, I think at UVA, it means being driven. Right? I've got some kind of dream. That's the dream I'm chasing it. See, look at me. I do all these things. I've got all these credentials. I've added all these things to my resume. I'm in this many clubs and leadership organizations. I'm so awesome. I won this prize. I won this thing. I'm on the lawn. Look at me. Look at me. I'm so great. I'm so driven. I have faith in myself and in this dream. Isn't that attractive to you? And as we talked about last week, we talked about how you can be good at producing things and not be good. You can be good at the rat race and not be a good person, not be good to other people. It doesn't mean your achievements are empty, but they're certainly not love. And so often I think we use that as a shorthand. Well, he's really involved. She does all these different things. That's like a really positive thing in many ways. I'm not saying it's a bad thing, but it isn't love. The last one is deliver my body. Now we can discipline and submit our bodies to something. In the Christian context, maybe it's martyrdom, maybe it's simplicity. Uh, on college campus, I mean, like, a lot of us are in the gym a lot, trying to deliver that body in a good position, right? Like, hey, look at this, like, I'm good, right? You're like, deliver that body to me, please, right? Like, we, we, we go and we see the body, and there's so many ways that the body physically, we're like, man, that is attractive, mm. like, you just can't even, like, pay attention in class, right? You just, you just, like, you're, like, supposed to be looking at lecture slides, and you're, like, <laughs> or, like, you're on Facebook. Let's be honest, half the reason we like Facebook stalking is because, like, you can see, like, Who's that cute guy? I'm at that org, but I need his name. He's in that other like Asian org family, but I get the oh, like, what does she look like? You like, oh, she's friends with her. We like Facebook stalking because it enables us to kind of look at other people. You know, the body, physical attraction is important, but it's also not love. And not that any of these things are bad, right? But but our world tells us that these are things you should look for when you look for love. Look for good grades. Look for someone who's uh, talented. Uh, who, who's very driven, who has rock hard abs or whatever. I mean, look for these things. But these aren't the same thing as having love. And I think that that's been the, the whole premise of this entire series. We've been told to look for a certain thing, and it's not like it's a bad thing. We've taken it in a certain kind of way that's not very good or healthy for us. These are gifts, opportunities, talents. They're nice things. They are not 
love. And so that's why actually you'll notice if you kind of like get good at those four things and kind of play them up, you'll be really good at the chase. Okay? The chase. You know what that is? You're nice and innocent. If you don't, you're like me, you've kind of been stupid with your life. You hunt somebody down, you're like, oh, she's attractive, I'm going to go after her, I'm going to like spit some game, kind of throw out my resume as a person, kind of like try to see if she's interested in me, right? The chase. Your, these four things will help you be good at the chase in this culture. But they will probably not have anything to do with how good you are as a boyfriend or girlfriend. And they might even be the reason why you don't get together. They may, be, they may be the reason you can kind of move towards somebody. But I don't think the same thing as kind of keeping a relationship going. We're talking about very different things here. They're not love. This is not love. So what is? Well, we go to the next part. And I'm going to read it again just because I like it so much and I think it's so important. So I just want to hear it again. Love is patient and love is kind. It does not envy. It does not boast. It is not proud. It does not dishonor others. It is not self-seeking. It is not easily angered. It keeps no record of wrongs. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but it rejoices with the truth. It always protects. It always trusts. It always hopes. It always perseveres. Love never fails. This is love. This. Nothing else. This is love. I'm sure you can talk about other ways of, well, this is the per permutations of these traits or ways that you live in them. Yeah, I'm sure. Okay, but this is the basis. I think this is fair to say this is love. As a Christian, I believe in the scripture because I believe it's from God, but I think also practically speaking, this is a pretty good definition in my lived experience. This is a good experience. I don't just believe it because I grew up in the church. I, I believe this because this is true in what I've lived. This is love. And, and if this is true, though, I think that there are two pieces of news that come from that that we have to reckon with. And the first of that is bad news. The first is bad news. Because if this is love, then I think this actually explains a lot of our issues. This explains a lot of the reasons that we've got problems in our relationships or just in life. I think that if we, if we really look at this list honestly, it can tell us a lot about ourselves as, as single people. As people who are in relationships, people who are out of relationships, or just got out of one or whatever. I think it tells us a lot about ourselves if we're honest, if we will let it tell us. I think it can, and it, at first we must say it's not really very good news, it's bad news. So what does it say about us? Well, I think the first thing it says is if, if you're single, what does this mean? Well, I think that in our culture we are so neurotically afraid, press months. thank you. We are so neurotically afraid of being single. We like really, really don't like being single. It's not even that you necessarily want to be with somebody, you just don't like to let people look at you, or people like say, like, oh, like, she's, she's not with anybody right now. Or like, oh yeah, he hasn't dated someone in like, a while. Yeah, that last one you knew, yeah, that was the last one. It was been a while. Right? You don't, we don't like that. I, I, I hear that all the time. We are neurotically afraid of being single. And I think what that can make us do is make us look, we need to be unsingle. Unsingle me, really quickly. We think of ourselves, I'm unboyfriended or ungirlfriended. And so what that can do is I can look at every person as a potential partner. Objectify them. Oh, like, where does she or he rank in the totem pole? How likely am I? Am my league? We, we, we objectify them. And I think we honestly objectify ourselves, too. I think it's not a very healthy way to think about ourselves. We think of ourselves as inferior. You know, you can even do this as a Christian. Uh, you can actually objectify people as a Christian. Even if they're a Christian, you're kind of looking for a Christian relationship. You can, you can say things like, you know, I'm really, I really want someone who's like really, really patient and really good at prayer. Like, I really want that. Right? And those are good things. I want someone who's patient and good at prayer. But what is your tone of voice? What does it sound like when I say that in my head? Is it, is it really because I think they're really good or is it something that I want to sort of like, it's a trophy boyfriend or girlfriend with good traits? I think when we're single, if we're not careful, if we just go by the way that we normally go, we can get stuck objectifying ourselves, seeing ourselves as less than what we are, or seeing other people as less than what they are, merely as, as, a, as a potential partner. I know sometimes people are like getting to know one another, they don't know that like one of them is dating somebody, and afterwards it's like, oh, like, you're not single. Okay, well, so much for that relationship, forget you as a friend. But people do this a lot, and I think that's actually really unfortunate and disrespectful. It can make us objectifiers. It's not very healthy. Well, what, what next? I think you can explain a lot about what we're like in relationships. What drives you in your relationships? You know, I, I remember when I was in high school in particular, I really was focused on being a good boyfriend. That's a pretty good thing, right? So, oh, good. Like, better than trying to be a bad boyfriend. Some people like to do that. But I was trying to be a good boyfriend. But as I spent time thinking about how I was and why I made my choices and how I felt when I did these things, if I'm really honest, I realized that, like, actually, my desire to be a good boyfriend actually was more about me than it was about my girlfriend. It was more about me and how I felt about myself than it was about them. 
Yes, I would give them a gift or whatever, and you surprise them with a rose or whatever after class. It's something random and cute like that, right? But then you're like, oh, it's so sweet that you got it. Right? Like, yeah, that's all good. Awesome. Okay. But then I also noticed that when she would tell her friends, or I would tell my friends, kind of in like the humble brag kind of way, like, yeah, I just, you know, she's so awesome. I just want to be sweet, you know? Like, all of the people around me would be like, oh, man, you're so good. Like, all that praise heaped upon me, and I actually almost liked that more. Being a good boyfriend was about me. How do you operate as you are in a relationship? Because I would notice that other times when if I would just give her a gift that she didn't like really like, or like my timing was bad or like something like that, and she didn't really like it, I would get mad. And I'm like, oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. Isn't gift giving about the other person? Obviously not. Not in that situation. It was about me. I wanted to be gratified. I wanted to be affirmed that she didn't let me have that. See, what I think happens is if, if we carry out our relationships not by the list that we talked about, not by the patient love list, the good list there, what ends up happening is we play it out in conflict or in codependence. Look, every person comes into a relationship with ideals, with desires, with goals, with non-negotiables, right? But there really is actually, I think, many times no way of knowing the other person's list. You just will never really know what the other person's list really is, right? And, and you might actually kind of like go through, and you should. You should actually have, and sit down, the con sit down and have a conversation and DTR, define the relationship, talk it out, like, what do you want, what do I want? You should actually do that, that's what adults do, okay? Uh, and, but honestly, even if you do that, you don't really know if what you're saying or what they're saying is really honest. Um, yeah, no, 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 I don't want anything serious. Me neither. No, I'm just, no, casual's great. Or, no, yo, I'm totally okay with going slow physically. People say things they don't mean because you're in this awkward phase where you're trying to figure something you don't know. You're still figuring, I totally understand that. We come to this sort of middle ground, we kind of come to this ambiguous middle ground where sometimes we say things we don't really mean. I think even into the DTR, you don't always know what they're really thinking. So what ends up happening is that whatever you really want, despite what you said, or whatever he or she really wants, despite what they said, begins to play itself on your relationship. And you begin to push and pull each other kind of gravitationally. You're going to push and pull and get pushed and you get pulled. And what ends up happening is you start to appease or concede when you disagree. Right? You want this and I want that. Okay, so I'll give you this. Or, well, I, I did this last time, so why don't you do this this time? Right? We, it's almost you, you negotiate. Right? Um, and, and I honestly think that these expectations are never really well met. Uh, we kind of just keep throwing them at the other person. Do this for me. There's no peace. There's no trust. There's no stability. And it honestly becomes very selfish or self-centered. You keep exerting expectations. You keep responding to their expectations. And what you get is you get this cycle of appeasement and taking. Appeasement and taking. You exert power or you concede it. So what can happen is, like, well, the boyfriend's only really sweet when I, when, like, we have sex, so like I should do that then, right? Because I want to be sweet. Well, the girlfriend's really only attentive when you know I, when I buy her gifts, so I should buy her stuff. Right? And it really allows for unhealthy expectations and desires to flourish. And usually, what happens is they break up, because when you all you have is kind of like my goals and your goals, right? Like we, I own half the votes in the room, so it's like I'm kind of done with this. Like I'm tired of your crap. I'm leaving. It only takes one person to break up, just so we all know. Okay? Um, you get tired of it. You no longer like the way that they're exerting their expectations on you. And, you know, why would you change? You get half the votes, you could just leave. You know, one of you quits or both of you quit, that's it. Done. So that's why people, you know, you get in a cycle of breaking up because we just can't seem to figure out what the expectations are or should be. Just war, 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 conflict all the time. But there is another option, and friends, this one is worse. This is when a screwed up relationship actually starts to work. You somehow have, like, similar or, like, non-conflictual expectations, and you seem happy to kind of appease the other person's expectations continually, so what happens is like all you do is kind of like give and give and take and take in this way that like you, you seem to be happy, but it's actually not very good for you, because it's still selfish. It draws you inward, you keep pulling in on each other, like, oh, I want this from you, you want this from me, like, oh, we keep pulling on each other, it's so nice, like, we, you kind of shrink down to this one horrible codependent thing. And, and codependent couples are awful. They're just awful. To be around. Have you ever been around a codependent couple? Oh my goodness, it is self isolating. They're annoying. They are cloying. They like to bring their like little inside jokes out in public because it makes them feel bad. Uh, what, what, why are you touching each other that way? It's not even appropriate. It's just creepy. What are you doing? Stop talking. Why do you, you. Those are creepy nicknames. That seems really scary. Like, stop that. Just stop. Right? But they like to do that because, like, well, this is what I want. This is what I want. This is what I want. No consideration for anybody else. No consideration for whether well, it's actually good for them, but this is what I want. I'm getting what I want. Codependence. It is two self-centered people joined together as one new self-centered entity. And the conflict is two self-centered people fighting each other until one of you quits or like it's a black guy or whatever. 
Hopefully you're not actually fighting, in which case you should talk to me. I'll get the university involved. Okay, but, but so we look at these things, right? And Christians are not immune to this kind of thought process or behavior. Christians are not. I mean, I've counseled plenty of Christians who, like, they, they use conflict language or they use co codependent language to talk about their relationships, their situation, and I can just see it. You know, they can even talk about, you know, Christian things or stuff, but they've got issues. We're not immune to this if you're being Christian, right? Because you can have all the faith in the world and not have love, right? Because if that's the list, man, there's going to really be some bad news here. The last category is sort of like, okay, what happens if you get broken up? Man, man, if you don't abide with this list, when you break up, ooh, Greg loves this part. He's going to clean it all up with all of you guys. It's so much fun. So what happens is we get vengeful or avoidant. That's typically what it is. Vengeful or avoidant. We channel our pain into destructive things because all that matters is my expectations, my expectations, my ideals, and they've, they've been hurt, they've been damaged, they've been, uh, you haven't kind of fulfilled them, and so we, we channel it destructively to try to get back some kind of measure of self-worth because I lost something to you, that's true, you lost something, so I want something back. You kind of do it in all different kinds of ways. You can lead other people on just to kind of like make you feel like, yeah, I still got it. Yeah, she likes me. I'm like her, but she likes me, so like, I'm still good. Right? We do that a lot. We lead people on. Right? Or we, maybe we want makeup sex or revenge sex with your ex's best friend, or we, you want to curse their memory and kind of just delight in all the ways that you are so superior to them, and they're terrible, we just conveniently forget about all the ways that like, we contributed, I contributed to the mess of my relationship, I just can forget all that stuff, because I am the better one, right? You have this bash fest with all your friends about your ex, yeah, she's terrible, like, he is so dumb, we are so much better, right? like, we, we do these things, we want to feel better, we want vengeance, I want blood, I want it back, because you took it from me. If you don't abide by that list, no, this is what you're going to do. The other thing you can do is be avoided. Um, maybe as Asians are more more passive aggressive, so maybe this is the route that maybe you are inclined to take. You're avoiding with the pain. And uh, you just, like, leave. You just leave. You join another organization you're, like, not interested in. And you start to, like, meet with, like, friends. You go back to, like, a friend group you, like, you lost touch with. Like, you're first to your hall. Like, you haven't lived with them and seen them. Like, to, hey, I really miss you guys. It's like, uh-huh, you really missed us, huh? Just broke, I just saw your Facebook status. I know why you're here. Okay. Right? We, have, we leave where we were because we can't deal with the pain. It's too hard. And we just try to get a new life, new friends, new gold. This is the semester I'm going to get the 4.0. I've heard that so many times. This is the semester. You know, on me, focusing on me, 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 we're going to get good grades now. Which, by the way, isn't very good motivation, because then you get depressed and you're in the library by yourself. So don't do that, okay? But, <laughs> but that, new goals, new life, new initiatives, new self. But the problem is, you may be able to construct a new life for yourself, but if I'm really honest, and I've done this before myself, you cannot construct a new heart for yourself. And so you just carry it, you just stuff it down, try to lock it in, and then the next person who happens to date you gets all that fun mess as they try to go in. Avoidance is another way that we do this when we are broken up. Now, actually, just to make a brief reference for those of you who are curious, I'm not just making these things up. Actually, in Scripture, God talks about these things. Uh, if you know at the beginning of the story in Genesis, when Adam and Eve reject God's rule, they reject his love, they say, I want to make my own way, make my own life, make my own love, we don't need you. When they reject God, what ends up happening is he says, like, yo, if you do this, you are going to change for the worse. I am fueling you with my love. I'm the one holding the universe together. If you reject me, if you really leave, this is going to get really bad, and it does. And he says, you know, the desire, you know, he's talking to, uh, to the woman, he's talking to Eve, he said, look, your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. And that to me sounds like codependence, my desire will be for him, I can't even think of anything else, I'm so distracted by him, codependence, codependence, codependence. He will rule over her, that's conflict, subjugation. We've been screwing up relations for a long time, folks, long, long time. Because false love and the things that we think we should pursue have been sold to us a long time too. We've been told, chase these things, be awesome, get these grades, be like this, measure up, and you'll be a catch. And like to a degree you will, but what will your heart be like? Your life might be a certain kind. What would your, what's your heart going to be like underneath? Because every time we do that, every time we go by the false love, it leaves us hurt or terrible or ugly. And that can be if you're single or with somebody or after you're with somebody. We end up there. We end up hurt and terrible and ugly. You know, when I look at this list, if I'm honest, what it does for me is I have to humbly look at it and say, okay, wow, maybe I got a lot of that stuff wrong. Maybe I thought I knew what love was. Maybe I had an idea what I wanted. Maybe I even tried my best. But if I look at this list, then I, 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 I don't think I really got it right. Love, love isn't what I thought it was, because 
Love is patient. Love is kind. It doesn't envy. It does not boast. It isn't proud. It doesn't dishonor others. It's not self-seeking. It's not easily angered. It doesn't keep a record of wrongs. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing. It rejoices with the truth. And it always protects and it always trusts and it always hopes and it always perseveres and love never fails. And goodness gracious, if you look back at my life, I think I fail all the time. I don't know any single one of those traits that I can really do very well most of the time. I'm really honest. Maybe love is not what I thought it was or I'm not as good as it. I'm not as good at doing it as I thought. And I think, you know, we've got this Disney twisted kind of version of romance. Physical and egotistical gratification, at least for me, it's what I wanted. I wanted affirmation for my insecurities. You know, kiss the girl, and it's all good. You can't even talk to her. What is wrong with you, Prince Eric? You don't even know what she's like. She could be crazy. <laughs> anyway, sorry, moving on, right? We don't, we don't know why we do the things we do sometimes. Or we, well, if you look at it now, you have all these reasons. But are they good ones? Are they loving ones? Now, the reason the bad news comes first is because I think it's good, actually. Because if you look at this bad news, if you look at this list, and you can say, and you can humbly say, okay, yeah, you know, I've got it wrong. There are things in me that don't get this right. I, I'm kind of a mess. That last relationship was awful. I'm pretty bad when I think about people that I'm interested in. I just am not very healthy. If you can say that, then I think there's a lot of freedom. Because it also gives you the freedom to say, okay, now I don't want it anymore. I don't want that anymore. I'm done with that. But, so what then? So let's say you're like me after my college breakup that was so devastating. And I was able to confess, okay, God, like, I just didn't get it. I was wrong. I don't want this anymore. I want something better. What do you do now? Here's the good news, is that God has an answer for that. And it's the same passage. See, the first thing that God wants to say to us through this thing, the most important thing at the end of the day after the bad news, is that you were made for love. We were made for love. You are made for this. This is what this list says. The author is counseling this group of people exploring faith and following Jesus, trying to figure life out, because he wants to remind them, this is what you're made for. You are so distracted by all these other things. Stop, stop, stop. This is what you're made for. You are made for this. We were created in the image of God as human beings so that we could love. We're not just animals. We are created specially so that we can have the capacity to have love that is rich and deep and transformative and fantastic. We're supposed to have this relationship with God where love from Him would make us secure and safe. And because of that, we would have the opportunity and the chance to trust other people and love other people. We'd be capable of loving others. We were made for love. And this list says two things to me in particular that are very, very, very important. I hope that you hear these things tonight. See, so the first thing this list, list tells me, you read this list over again, love is like this. What it tells you is that you deserve this. You, this list, you deserve this in your relationship. You were made for this. You were created for relationships that operated in this kind of love. Instead of selfish kind of holding back, others would be generous with you. Instead of the clingy, needy, life-sucking codependence, you were made for relationships that where you could feel understood and appreciated, where you could trust somebody, where you would have space to grow, and you were to be all you could be. That's the kind of relationship you were meant for, not whatever other stuff I've run around kind of chasing. You were made for this kind of love. You were made for a love that would build you up, that would encourage you, that you could trust, that would seek the best for you. Not this Disney kind of romantic, random, hocus-pocus, circumstantial kind of love. You were made for a real love. We're not talking about a magical kiss. We're talking about a love that is good enough for your difficult life. We have difficult lives. You need a love that's good enough for that, that won't leave you when your carriage turns back into a freaking pumpkin. You need a love that is better than that. And you are made for a love that is better than that. You were made for a love that could withstand and help you live rightly in the midst of all of life's difficulties. See, this kind of love eventually uh, confirms and commits itself in the bond of marriage. Okay, so this is not a marriage talk. I'm not trying to go that way. I'm just saying that's where that goes. Okay, And marriage in the church and in Christianity is supposed to be a certain kind of way. It's supposed to mean a certain kind of thing. So I want to talk a little bit about that because that's where that's where I think our heart's desires really wound. We may not have a name for it. It kind of freak you out. It's okay. But I'm going to say this is where it goes. Because what it's supposed to be is supposed to be a sacred covenant. That when you look at the other person, you say, I do, you're saying, with God's help, I will love you and never leave you. There is not actually supposed to be divorce in the Bible. It's not supposed to be there. But people get screwed up. We do the wrong things. Right? And it's something to be judgmental or unkind. Right? But we're supposed to be in a world where relationships last. And you survive. And you figure it out. And you grow. We don't quit. We don't leave. We don't cheat. We stick it out because God helps us. Do that. You are made for that because that's a wonderful kind of trust. See, if you're in a relationship now, you find yourself constantly defending your significant other's temper tantrums. 
or their moods, you find yourself getting pulled away from other things in your life, like your friends or your work or other stuff that matters, if you find yourself getting pulled that way because he really needs me right now, then I want to lovingly tell you, you are made for love, so get out. Better than that. You deserve more than that. If you find yourself being second-guessed, distrusted, made to feel inferior because you're not thin enough or rich enough or smart enough or whatever, I want to tell, I want to tell you, you were made for love. So get out of that. Leave it behind. You deserve better. If your significant other has ever threatened you or cheated on you or even said something like, you know, I could have done with anybody else, but I'm with you. I'm doing you a favor. If you've ever heard that, okay, you need to get out right now because you were made for love. Not anything less than that. And so many times, because we get deceived by these other motivations or we're lonely, I know the loneliness can be really bad sometimes, but when we're lonely, we just say, well, look, this person is here. This thing is here. We're not even really a whole person. We're kind of, I don't know, it's a friend relationship. We're kind of hookup buddies. I don't know what we are, but you're here. I get that. But you deserve better. You were made for this list. You were made for this kind of love. I just want to say, you're also made for sex, too. I don't want to spend a lot of time on it, but sex is part of what God intended for us. People talk a lot about sex at college, too, so we've got to talk about it today. Uh, but it's not just any kind of sex or with whoever or whatever, right? Um, because sex isn't just a physical coupling, not the way God made it for it to be. It's actually, it kind of sounds kind of weird, it's a sacred act. Yeah, it's a sacred act. That's what God says. In the beginning and throughout, sex is a sacred act that we get to actually enjoy in the right time and place. I think so often sex becomes about me, like, well, how am I going to feel? Or like, what will you give me in return, right? Um, but, but that's not what it was for. Sex was meant for a place of trust. It was actually meant for marriage. I'm not kind of saying this to kind of judge anybody or kind of put places or tell you the rules. But I'm telling you what God meant it for and why. I'm just going to show you why. Because the sex you have in marriage is supposed to mirror the total trust you have in the marriage relationship. It is two lives joined together. In the scripture it says, two become one flesh. And that doesn't just mean like, yeah, you get to have sex now. No, it means two full lives Joined together into one new life. Not codependently, not diminishingly, but side by side together. And the sex gets to mirror that. No one, no, no one kind of owns the other person or owes anything to anybody else. You come together, you join together, you are one flesh together. It's supposed to mirror that. And because you can do that, because that's trusting, because that's, you have this person you know is never going to leave you, all it is is joy. You can kind of have an off night and not perform very well. It's not going to matter because you're not going to leave me. You can kind of be like, I don't want to do that right now. And you say, okay, well, I'll be here tomorrow, right? Or the next day, or the next day, or the next day, right? You don't have to feel ashamed, right? It says in Scripture, Adam and Eve were naked. They walked around naked all day long, and they felt no shame, okay? I just want you to imagine for a minute, you're walking in Newcomb, you're walking through Clark, and all of a sudden, all of a sudden, all of your clothes disappear. <laughs> Let that linger for a minute. Imagine that. Imagine you're walking through Newcomb, or Clark, or O'Hill, up the stairs, right? All close to How would you feel? Holy crap! Get me a tray, get me newspapers, give me the cow daily, cover me up. I don't want you to see me, right? But Adam and Eve, didn't, they weren't afraid. They weren't afraid to show, I don't know, their secrets, their stomach, their love handles, their quirks, their scars, because they, what do you, this person, I can trust this person. They're never leaving. It doesn't matter. They can see it. Because so often, Sex and relationships in general are used in a way, we engage them in a way that when we feel, we actually don't feel trust at all. We feel the opposite of trust. We feel more vulnerable. We want emotional or physical ecstasy, and the price we can pay is real sense of security. And that's not what God meant for us. And sex actually works, folks. It makes you crazily attracted and attached to the person. That's a good thing if you're going to, like, I don't know, carry your whole life together as a couple. That would be a good thing. That's what sex is supposed to do. It does that. So God is effect. God made a good thing. It actually works. Folks, you and I all deserve better. We all deserve better than the partial love we've been experiencing in our physical or emotional kind of relationships or whatever. And I don't say that out of judgment. I say that as out of love. We deserve better. This list is what you were made for. There's one more thing this list shows us. It shows you that I can be this. This list, patient, loving, kind, generous. I can be that. Now, I'm not right now. But this list is, I can be that. God can make me like that. He made me to live that way. He makes me confident, excited, because I can grow to become that person, not stay stuck as the person I may be now or that screwed up the last relationship. I can be this. 
Greg Shu, I don't have to be a volatile, angry, vengeful, argumentative, domineering male anymore, okay? I can be patient and loving and kind. I, don't, I can learn not to freak out when the GPS goes crazy and I lose my way and I'm driving around Atlanta. And I can learn to not scream the way that freaks my girlfriend out and makes her feel unsafe. I can learn those things. I can learn to not scare her. I can learn to be a better man who is good, who doesn't harm people, who has my emotions and my stuff in control, self-control, who is patient, who doesn't for, remember the things that she does wrong. I can do things. I can be a better boyfriend, a better husband, a better father, a better person. I can be that. You can be that. That's what this list says. Now, you may have all kinds of issues, and you may know them down to a T. You may have a list in your head. These are six reasons why I'm not fit to be with anybody or why that last one went really bad. It's all my fault. And those could be true. I'm not actually denying that those are false. But what this list says is you hate that list. You hate this little list of my issues. And God says, you know what? I hate it too. And that's the best news ever. Because I'm going to help you get rid of it. I'm going to take it out. I'm going to clean it out. I'm going to change. He wants to transform our hearts so that we have a good heart, not a damaged or vengeful or distrustful or insecure heart. Your heart can be like this good list. And you don't just conjure it out of air. So I want to explain what it is that we can do here. You know, God says he wants to give us the love that we need to become this good way. And it's all on God. He says, I will give it to you. I will make it happen. I will give you a new heart. I will do it for you if you'll let me. Because if it's all on God, that's what makes it work. I'm limited. I'm human. I get stuck. I run out of energy, but God is not. That's what we can say love never fails. Real love never fails. Real love doesn't run out. Real love doesn't get impatient. Real love doesn't turn to hate when things go sour. You know, when it says love never ends, it doesn't mean you're never going to break up. <laughs> it means that when you do, if you do, you will have the character to humbly come before God and say, okay, that didn't go very well, and I'm kind of a mess. And you will have the, the character and the security to do what's right and leave it behind and not get stuck, not get angry, not stay hurt. That's what that means, love never ends. Love never ends is good for me in any stage of my relational life. You can be good, you can be loving, you were made to be this. So I'm gonna briefly kind of tell you how. Because I think this good news and this bad news is simultaneously true, okay? I'm bad in all these ways, all right? And this is a list that I wanna be. How do I get there? What do I do? Well, God wants to give us a new heart. The only way for us to do this is to get a new heart. So I'm going to tell you what it is. This is one of the main reasons I think I'm, I'm still a Christian. Uh, because I, at the end of all of these terrible experiences relationally, and I was so depressed, actually to the point of being suicidal for one time, it was really, really bad. Uh, God said, I can actually do something better. I'm going to give you a new heart. Um, he showed me the fullness of his love, how good it can be, how good it would be for me and for other people. He said, you can have this, Greg. This is what you're made for. Do you want it? Yeah, God does this because he is love. And you can have that. He actually offers for us a new heart. You know, he lo he, God so loved the world that he sent his only son, Jesus, who is fully God and fully man, to show us how beautiful this life could be. He sent us his son to show us how beautiful everything could be. Everything is so messed up. But God said, no, I want to show you. It does not have to be this way. It can be better. It can be good. And there were people who, like me when I was younger, were so good at kind of measuring up, didn't want to be told that I could be loved. I just wanted to succeed. Jesus, get out of my way. You're kind of my style. I am good at this. I am successful. And all you keep saying is you want to give away love for people freely. No. I don't know why. So people like me, people like that, put Jesus away and they killed him. But the power of God in him was so powerful because he was fully God and fully man. He was so powerful that he actually came back to life. I believe that as a, as, as a Christian. Okay, that's a fact in my book. It's not just kind of a symbol. Okay, that's an actual fact. Jesus Christ is an actual human being who was actually killed, who actually came back to life because he's actually fully God and fully man. Okay, now you may not be able to wrap your head around it, but let me keep going and explain why this matters. Because the life and the love in him was so powerful that nothing, not even death, could hold it back. There was more life in him than there was death in the world. He was so full of life, so full of love, that everything else that came at him, he could just push down. Got back out of the grave. I'm alive. Just got back up. Come at me, bro. I killed you. <laughs> and he said, because I've done this, because I've offered this life and this love for you, you can have the life I have. You can be filled with a heart that is so powerful that not even death can stop you. We talk about eternal life in Christianity. That's not this kind of just like, oh, like you die and go to heaven. It's not just that. It's a life that is so full, eternal, not just temporally, but quantitatively. So full of God's love. It just spills out of you. You've got so much to give. So much to give. Your heart can be so full. Your life can be so full. Jesus says, you can have that. We can have that. Maybe that's a new concept for you. I know. Maybe you heard this a long time ago. You're like, I'm not sure this is so true. Let me keep going. Because that's the offer that he made to me. 
And he's made repeatedly, this is what you can have. You can have a new life. Because I'm fully God and fully man, I've kind of cut this terrible stuff that we call sin in Christianity, all that bad stuff, all these bad relationship experiences, all the misery, all the ugliness, we call that sin. It's not breaking God's rules or the cookies out of the cookie jar, it's something much more fundamental. It's stuff that really hurts and keeps you up at night. That stuff, that's sin. And Jesus said, I'm fully God and fully man, I got rid of it. Done. Is that the life you want? Do you want a life that doesn't have that stuff? Maybe. Maybe I do. And he said, if you trust me, if you'll let me, if you'll know me, if you'll allow me, if you'll follow me, I'll give you a new heart. Is that what you want? And this new heart, man, this new heart, it changes everything about you. It changes your, your body. It changes your mind. It changes your desires. It changes your thoughts, your decisions. It changes so many things about you. I'm a different man today, not because I read a lot of stuff or worked out or whatever. It's because this heart in me did all the change. The person I am today giving you guys advice about the stuff I give, I could not have done that. Even three years ago, even four years ago, five years ago, I could not have done any of those things. I wasn't good enough. But the heart that God put in me, it is good enough. It keeps getting better. God offered it to me, not because of my expertise, but because he was generous, because I was a broken-hearted boy who just couldn't get it right. And I think we're kind of all there. So I know that some of you don't come from Christian or much religious background. I understand that. But I want to tell you this because this is what I think it takes to get the kind of heart, the kind of love that you've always wanted. Don't see it in religious categories. See it in yourself, your identity, your very self. What is it going to take for you to get a heart that is good enough that can handle what you really need to handle? There's no shame in that. There's no shame in needing that. So what I want to do, I want to offer us time to reflect and respond. Katie's going to come up and uh, Ash too, and they're going to play a bit of music. And, and this is just for you to think and, res and reflect and respond. And, you know, this may not apply to all of you. You may kind of feel like, okay, this is interesting, great, I feel like this is really helpful. Cool, that's great. Or you may not have liked it at all. I understand. Uh, and if you're just here, like, you know, that's cool. I thank you for being here. But some people in here, you've been here maybe multiple weeks, or maybe it's even your first time, you're like, well, there's something you're saying that it might be true. It might be true. And there's something I need to do to move forward. God always wants us to move forward. No matter your place in the journey, he always wants you to move forward. Um, he invites us to take steps, right? Whether you were growing up like, in the church forever, you've never been to church in your life. I feel like God has always invited me to take steps. And that's where it's the same for all of us. And so what I want to do is I'm going to talk a little bit about some of these steps. And uh, let's just hit all three to the other one. Hit all three. Um, you know, as we're wrapping up the Measure Up series and tonight in particular, I think that the theme that you've probably heard from me talk about is that you need to, we're invited to trust. We're invited to trust that there's something better than the way we do things. This is, we're invited to trust that God might actually be gracious. I mean, he might actually be loving. He might actually be as good as he says he is, or at least as I am saying that he is. Maybe you've never considered that before. So there may be steps you want to take. So I want to let you just, there are three steps I want you to consider. The first is uh, checkup. Um, Sophie, here, take the cups, thank you. Uh, Sophie's going to pass out uh, some cups, and in those cups you'll find uh, a little card and some pe uh, a pencil. And just something for you to use, kind of think, you're kind of like, okay, like, where am I? And uh, if you don't use it, I'm never going to know. So it's really just for you. It's really just for you to process what I think about, okay? And, and the first item you could check off on this list for steps you could take is get a check. Uh, maybe, whether you're single or in a relationship or you've just broken up or something, like there may be something you want to talk about. You're like, yeah, I've got a lot of stuff in my life that like, I don't want someone talking to you about. Well, if that's you, if you want to help with that, please, please, please check that box. Put your name in there. Because like, I would love to meet up with you. No one has to know. My meetings are confidential. Like, I'm, I'm really good about that. Like, I don't want to tell anyone your business. Right? Maybe you're like, okay, like I'm single now or we're in a relationship and it's kind of messed up. We just broke up and it's really bad. I'm really stuck, right? If you want some help, please come. Just, just check that box. I'd love to meet up with you in the next couple weeks. We can talk about anything you want to talk about, okay? Anything at all. But if you want help, if you want to talk to, it doesn't have to be me either. We have other leaders too, right? But check that box, and we'll get we'll follow up with you and kind of help you figure that out. We'll be glad to get you sorted out a little bit. Do whatever we can do to help you. The second thing we want to do is maybe real love. This real love we're talking about tonight, this list of traits, is like, oh, like that is actually something I really want. I'm really honest, of all my friendships, of all my communities, of most of the I live my life at UVA, I don't really experience that. I'm always running on the treadmill trying to do better. You no. Know? Um, we invite you to experience that. Uh, we, you know, you, you can't experience, you can't give it away if you've never experienced it. And maybe you're feeling that right now. I'm in a lot of places and I really want to experience that kind of love from God. Now look, Asian River Arsene, we're a community that is open to all types. We are all different backgrounds, all different experiences. And, and maybe you're seeking to move forward and you're like, okay, I want to move forward on that. I want to experience that. Well, check that box. 
we'd love to give you some practical ways. You can get along with family, you can meet some people, you can start to meet people when, you know, I, I meet with people on a regular basis and mentor people, right? We're gonna wait a beach screen in a couple weeks. Maybe you never heard about it until tonight. You're like, oh, that beach thing sounds pretty good. It's only 30 bucks. Yeah, it is pretty good, and it's only 30 bucks. So check that box. We'd love to get back to you and kind of tell you there are ways you can step forward as a community. Right? So to, to be part of a community, to connect with this community, let's just extend the invitation of God. It's not about our numbers, it's not about anything. It's just about giving you a place to help you feel and know what God really feels about you. Because you deserve that. You were meant for that. We just want to invite you into that if you want that. So check that second box if you like, yes, I'm open to being part of a community. The last thing uh, is new heart. And there's an analogy that Jesus uses. He talks about wine and a wine skin. Yes, he talks a lot about alcohol, which is kind of funny. But wine and wine skin. And he says, you know, you need a new wine skin to hold new wine. If you put new wine in like an old skin, all that ends up happening is that it'll crack, it'll leak, and it won't hold it in. And I think that's kind of what it's like for me in my life and a lot of what we need in terms of our, this love that we're talking about. You need a new heart, right? We just talked about here. Um, so maybe God is calling you and telling you, yeah, you need a new heart. Maybe that completely freaks you out. You're like, whoa, okay, I'm not really ready for that, but you hear it. Or maybe you're like, no, I've been hearing about this, I've been thinking about this, this actually is exactly what I want. So maybe for some of you, maybe some of you tonight need to say, yeah, that's actually what I need to do. I need to commit to trusting God that way. I need to commit to trusting God that he's going to give me a new heart because I cannot do this way. I cannot do this this way. It's not good enough. Maybe some of you are like, you know, I'm not ready, but I do feel this thing here. I am exploring. It is making sense. This stuff makes sense. I want to explore this more. Look at the second box of this. Is I commit to exploring. We'd love to follow up with you either way. I'm going to help you figure out what you should do next. And I look, I know some of you maybe in here, you're like, okay, this doesn't really apply to me. Great. Thank you for coming. But I just want to give us a chance now to think as a uh, skinny national play. Uh, just to reflect. What I want to invite you to do is if you did ch if you checked anything on there, okay, I would love for you to fold up that card and put it in the bucket in the back. If you don't do it, I'm not gonna know. Right? If you don't do it, I'm not gonna care, right? But but it just gives us a chance to be able to follow up with you. We'd love to do that for you. Right? You can do it during this. Time. I'm going to dim the lights and I'm just going to be like walking around, looking, looking around being creepy. Okay? It's not going to be like that, right? But I want to give us time to reflect because I think so many times at UVA we don't reflect, we just do. Let me say a quick prayer here as we kind of go into this reflection time. God, I want to thank you for the love you have for us. Thank you that this love is better than any love that we can imagine. Thank you that we are made for this love. Thank you that you tell us that we deserve this love, even, even though sometimes we feel like we've just done so many things wrong or we feel like we just cannot even be this good. You tell us that we can be this good. And you tell us that this is who we're supposed to be. God, I pray for people here tonight that wherever they are in their journey, that if, if you have a step for them to take, if they feel that, would they have the courage to go to do that? Because, Lord, you love us. It can be scary. It can be new. It can be totally different than how I grew up. But, Lord, you're inviting us to take steps because when we move closer to you, we feel more of that love. And that love can change us. That love can change us and our friends, and our families, and our relationships can change everything about us. So God, I pray for those people here tonight. Lord, I know there's people here from really different backgrounds. But I want to thank you for being here, for taking the risk of just coming out and listening to me yammer on for a long time. Lord, I just pray that they would know that you love them. No matter what happens, no matter what they check or don't check, just pray that everyone would know that you love them. But Lord, for those who know there's something going on, who know they need to say yes to something, who know they need to commit to something or get some help or move forward, would you give them the love, would you help them feel that love and know that you are there for them? You want them to move forward for them. Not for Greg, not for the people in the room, but for for them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much.